What's up everybody? I'm Jason and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5. This is episode 63. We're talking about video. We're going back to basics and this time we're going to round out the movie record size menu page and talk about the compression methods that you can use when shooting video. And as always, most of what I'm covering in this video also applies to Canon's other mirrorless cameras such as the R6, R7, R3, etc. However, not all of the cameras implement all of the features. For example, raw recording may use different bit rates due to their target markets. So for example, the R6 uses lower bit rates than the R5 or simply may do something slightly different. For example, the R3, which does support raw recording, implements it differently than the R5 does. As always, the focus of these videos is on the R5. It's what I own, it's what I shoot with, it's what all the testing and demonstrations in this video were done with. However, as a result, if you are using a different Canon camera, R3, R7, whatever, then the exact details that you may have on your camera may differ from what's being shown here. So if your camera doesn't do something that I'm talking about, check the manual. It may not be able to do it, or it may just do it by using a setting somewhere else. So as I said, we're talking about compression methods. Canon calls them compression methods in the manual. It's actually, I think, a little bit more complicated than just compression methods. A little bit gets into the quality side of things as well. In any event, we're going to talk about raw and compressed video formats. We're going to talk about the implications of choosing different compression settings. And we are going to talk about, of course, how to change the compression method that your camera is using. So we're going to start with the easy one. Uh, it might not be the most applicable option, but it is certainly the easiest option to talk about, which is raw video. Truthfully, it's really only simple because of what options or how few options you have when dealing with it. In reality, what's going on under the hood is far more complicated than I'm presenting and than most people will even try to present when talking about raw video. So what is raw video on the R5? Well, Put simply, it's 12-bit sensor data read out at the same at the native resolution of the sensor that has minimal processing done to it in camera. Now I say minimal because it's not quite zero processing, but it is very close to no processing. So the image is not debayered, which means that the image has to be processed on your post-processing software, so your NLE or through other post-processing software to have a usable image. No chroma subsampling is done or color space adjustments or anything like that for the raw video, which also means that white balance adjustments are saved as metadata. They're not baked in to change pixel values. So in that sense, it's very close to read out the data from the sensor, tweak it a little bit to make it more efficiently storable and then stick it on the card. But like I said, most people just say it's the native sensor data from the, or native data from the sensor and that's it. And that's not quite technically true. Now, as I said, this is probably going to be your highest quality option on the R5, at least assuming that your post-processing software can actually make use of it well. So advantages for shooting in RAW come down to quality. It's going to be, it, it's higher, much higher bit rate than any of the other options that the camera supports. And it's also shot at a higher bit depth. So it's 12 or stored at a higher bit depth. So it's 12 bits, not eight or 10, which are what the other compressed options use. And then because it is not pixel adjusted in camera, or the pixel values aren't adjusted in camera for things like color curves or white balance, those adjustments when you make them in post are first generation corrections. Those advantages come with some pretty big, in my opinion, disadvantages. These are all, all surmountable problems, but they are definitely disadvantages to shooting in RAW. So first of all, the files are huge. Canon targets 1.35 to 2.6 gigabits per second as the bitrate for their RAW files on the R5. This translates to uh, less than 15 minutes of recording on a 128 gigabyte card. Second of all, the camera doesn't give you any resolution options. The only way that you, the only option you have on the R5 is to shoot 8K DCI format. You can't crop mode, which would really be nice to have, uh, but that's not a factor or not available. The biggest potential problem for most people, aside from size and so forth, ultimately is going to come down to what your post-processing situation looks like. So you have two fundamental problems here. First is the raw video requires some kind of post-processing software support, 
And second of all, if that's not built into the NLE that you use, there's an, an added workflow hassle of dealing with it. Both DaVinci Resolve and Adobe Premiere Pro have native support for decoding and editing Canon's Cinema RAW files. From what I have read, although I don't have any personal experience with this, Premiere Pro's image quality is markedly worse than DaVinci Resolve's in this respect. If you are using Avid Media Access or Final Cut Pro, Canon provides a plugin for download on the support page for the R5 that allows you to edit raw video in those programs. Now for any other NLE that you want to use that doesn't support raw or Canon's raw or a plugin available from Canon for it, the third option is to use Canon's Cinema Raw development tool. It's a standalone program, again, available for download on the R5 support page. This allows you to make the same like color corrections, exposure, etc. adjustments to your raw file and then output it as either a DPX file, an open EXR file, or if you are on a Mac, ProRes in either 4444 or 422 high quality as your compressed options. Unfortunately, if you're on Windows, you only get DPX and OpenEXR. Now bear in mind that DPX and OpenEXR are going to make the raw files significantly larger. I think ProRes is as well. Significantly larger than they are from the start. So you need to have a lot of space, even more space, I should say, for dealing with this workflow if you have to do this. Finally, you can open the digital raw video files or the Canon raw video files in Digital Photo Professional. You can't do anything from a video aspect with it, but you can extract frames as stills. The extracted still frames are about 28 megapixels if they're cropped to a 3 to 2 aspect ratio, and you end up with about a 1.26 crop factor compared to a full frame still if you were going about it in this route. Now, to shoot or enable raw compression on the R5, there are three requirements that you have to meet to be able to do this. So first of all, the camera has to be set to full frame mode. You cannot shoot raw in movie crop mode, which means you can't either get the free teleconverter effect, uh, smaller files, which you would get from 5.1K raw as opposed to 8K raw, or use EFS or Super 35 lenses when shooting with that. Well, I guess technically you could use Super 35 lenses and then crop the video in post, but you don't get the in-camera adjustment or the in-camera. Secondly, the camera has to be set to 8KD resolution. Uh, you can't use any of the other smaller resolutions, so 4K or 1080p, simply because they're no longer raw. And for whatever reason, you can't select 8KU, even though that's just a smaller window for native readout on the sensor, but that's the choice Canon has made with this. Finally, due to the bit rates that Canon's RAW files are read at or written at, CF Express, you have to use a CF Express card as your output. So recording in RAW on the R5, you will be presented with two potential options, or two options for your RAW recording modes, RAW and RAW Lite. Bear in mind that there are apparently or very clearly differences in how Canon's Cinema EOS people and Photo EOS people handle this stuff. So raw and raw light here don't directly correspond to either the old raw and new raw light Cinema EOS codecs or specific settings in the Cinema EOS codec. So this isn't like everything is raw light and these two quality levels are ST and LT, which is what you would have on the R5C. So these are subtly different from the R5C in how they are operating, at least in terms of bit rates. Which brings me to talking about bit rates. So the two different RAW options, RAW targets higher frame Im or higher image quality. The camera only uses one bit rate for all frame rates. That is 2.6 gigabits per second. If you're kind of like me and you're thinking like, tell me what that means in terms of how much time I can shoot on a given card, a 128 gigabyte card will be filled in less than seven minutes in this configuration. So 128 gigabyte cards were huge to me as a photographer. Like I could shoot for a week or more on a 128 gig card and never get close to filling it. Video, raw video especially, seven less than seven minutes per 128 gig card. 
Raw light targets uh, smaller file sizes, and on R5, it's implemented as two different bit rates. So for 25 and 30 frame per second content, it's 1.7 gigabits per second, or it will fill a 128 gig card in just under 11 minutes. The other option with raw light, which I, should, I shouldn't say option because you can't select it, but the other configuration that the camera uses for raw light is when you're shooting in 24 frames a second. So this is either the NTSC 24 frame per second frame rate or the true 24 frame per second frame rate. The camera will target 1.35 gigabits per second. This will fill a 128 gig card in 13 minutes. So RAW poses some definite op advantages in some respects with respect to image quality, comes at the cost of massive file sizes and a necessity for support in your RAW or your NLE to generate or to generate images that actually maximize and utilize that quality. So if you don't have a way to deal with files that big or a real need for dealing with files that big. What are your other option? Well, that brings us to the compressed formats on the R5. Now, the compressed formats, or at least talking about them, is more complicated than just talking about RAW. RAW was easy, as I said. It may not be the most applicable, but it was easy. You take the sensor data, you stuff it in a file, you put it on the card. We don't have to talk about anything like chroma subsampling or bit depth or frame types or the codec being chosen or anything like that. When it comes to the compressed formats on the R5, Canon has decided with their hybrid still first kind of cameras, so the non-cinema cameras, I should say, to essentially combine all of the configuration options that you would have for a compressed video file into basically three settings that you can choose from. So when I talk about configuration options, I'm talking about stuff like, again, the codec. Is it being recorded in AVC or HEVC? What types of frames is it using? Is it all intra-frame compressed or is it uh, IPB compressed? The bit depth that the camera's running at, what kind of chroma subsampling is being done, etc. All of that kind of stuff is rolled fundamentally into three settings or one plus two settings, depending on how you want to look at it. So there's the movie record size setting, which controls some of this, specifically the frame types and bit rates. And then there's the HDR, PQ, and Canon log settings, uh, which simply need to be enabled that control codec, color depth, uh, or bit depth, and chroma subsampling based on what they're chosen from. So the short of it is the movie record size menu it, for the compressed formats is less of exact controls and more of sort of a selection of quality levels without getting too hooked up in the details. Now, that said, there's a lot of you out there like me who are going to get hooked up in the details because we're going to want to shoot 422 chroma subsampled instead of 420 for a variety of reasons. Maybe we're doing green screen work. We're going to care about the bit depth that we're shooting in because you know, maybe we want better color depth or maybe we're getting into doing HDR content or something like that. We're going to care probably less these days about the frame type that's being used. So I'm going to talk about these different aspects of the compressed format and we'll talk about how these are all controlled and what the pros and cons are. So the first thing to talk about, I want to talk about our frame types as this is literally what Canon shows you when you're in the movie record size menu, choosing a compressed option that's not raw. And there are three options that you will find for the frame type and bit rate that the camera uses. So first of all, you'll see all I. If you're coming to this from the cinema camera world, this would also be called intra-frame compression. Then you have IPB. If you're coming to this from the cinema camera world, you would probably see this as long GOP or long GOP or just GOP. GOP stands for group of pictures here. Finally, there's IPB light, which is the same as IPB. It's just targeting lower bit rates. So what is all I and when should you care or want to use it? Well, all I is intra-frame compression. And put simply, all this means is that every frame of video you shoot is stored in the file as a standalone image. 
So it has some pros and cons. On the pro side, there's less overhead for compression and decompression. It's easier for the camera to write it or create the files. It's easier for your computer to decode the files if you're doing editing. And I say that with a big asterisk by it, because this has traditionally been the comp the reason that people say you should shoot in all eye for editing. And that may very well have been the case 10 or 15 years ago when we got started with digital cinematography and computers weren't where they are now. However, computers now are pretty darn powerful. And while you may not be able to decode uh, 12 all eye video streams in parallel on a CPU in a computer like today, uh, at like 8K, let's say, we also have advantages now in the sense that pretty much every GPU on the market can decode both AVC and HEVC, which are the two compression algorithms that the camera uses in any of these modes. So playback is uh, a playback of all I files is not as big of an advantage as it used to be over IPB files. Now the flip side to this is that because each frame is a solid complete frame and there is no temporal compression being applied, each frame has to store every pixel in that frame. As a consequence of that, each frame has to take more bits or be larger, and as a consequence of that, the file sizes are larger in general. So on the R5, the camera targets 50 to 1,000 megabits for 30 and 60 frame per second 4K footage respectively, and even up to 1,300 megabits for 8K footage. Now the other option for frame types is IPB. And the name of the format on the R5 literally tells you the three frame types that are actually used. So the I stands for intra. Basically, this is what all I all was. So the I and all I and the I and IPB are actually the same thing. This is a whole picture. The other two frame types are predictive and bipredictive. So basically, these are the temporal compression options for the camera. The short of it is, P frames are smaller than I frames and B frames are smaller than P frames. And when you have I, B, and P frames in your uh, compressed group of pictures, that whole group of pictures can be made a whole lot smaller because the P and B frames only have to store differences between other frames. So the advantage, of course, is for a given quality, the bit rate of a IPB for compressed format is lower than what it would be in all I. Now, the flip side of this is that IPB requires more overhead for compression and decompression. So the second consideration with the compressed formats is the codec that's used. So the, the actual compression algorithm that is used. And the Canon R5 supports two different codecs for compressing video. You can't choose them directly, but you can choose them indirectly. These are H.264, which is also known as AVC. It operates at 8-bit and 420 chroma subsampling and H.265, which is also known as HEVC. And when this is being used, the camera operates at 10-bit with 422 chroma subsampling. The real advantage of AVC at this point is that it's less computationally intensive than HEVC, so it's a little bit easier to deal with on computers. Uh, but your flip, the flip side of that is, is that the image isn't going to be you know, it doesn't have as much bit depth or chroma data, chrominance data behind it, so it's not going to be quite as good. So the question then becomes, as I said, this is not something that you can directly set in a menu. How do you pick or get the camera to shoot in one of these two modes? And the answer is HDRPQ or Canon Log. It doesn't matter how you have HDRPQ or Canon Log set up, and I will have videos talking about setting these up in the future, but as long as either one of those modes are enabled, then the camera will record in HEVC at 10-bit with 422 chroma subsampling. Before I jump into talking about how to make the change, I want to make one last note talking about bitrate and quality from the compressed, uh, the compressed stuff, specifically the differences between HEVC and AVC. So if you are remotely familiar with any of this stuff or can just do some math in your head, you may have noticed that when the camera is shooting HEVC files, there's actually a lot more information being recorded. So going from 8 bits to 10 bits means that you have 25% more information per pixel in terms of bit depth. And going from 420 to 422 means that the camera is recording twice as much chroma information for an entire or given frame. So that's about a 125% increase in data that the camera is trying to save. 
Now you might also notice that that has, ha, something has to do, be done to, to compensate for that. Well, the camera actually has three things going for it in the, this respect. So first of all, when the camera is in HEVC mode, it targets about 40% higher bit rates than it has when it's in AVC mode. So it will make bigger files. Uh, now, obviously 40 is not 125, but on the same token, when we're talking about compression, Increasing the amount of input information by 125% doesn't necessarily mean that the compressed data will increase by 125%. It's not, the, there's a compression factor that happens and that's not necessarily linear. The second part of how Canon addresses this is simply the fact that they're using HEVC instead of AVC. So HEVC is more efficient at compressing information or providing a better quality image than AVC is at the same bitrate. The third thing is, and this has both applications to maintaining quality between the two compression levels, as well as what you can expect in terms of file sizes when you're coming at the camera, coming to the camera from other places, is that by and large, Canon tends to use very high bit rates on their high-end mirrorless cameras. So specifically the R5 and R3, the bit rates that the camera targets are way higher than what people would expect or what most people would be used to if you're used to shooting on, say, low-end mirrorless cameras, action cameras, or your smartphone. So just to put some examples to this, on my iPhone 12 mini, if I'm shooting 4K 30 content, it's HEVC, it's 420 chroma subsampled, and the phone targets about 46 megabits. If I'm shooting 4K 60, again, HEVC 420 chroma subsampled, my phone targets about 80 megabits. On the R5 4K 30, again, shooting 422 HEVC at 10 bits, in the lowest quality mode the camera supports, so IPB light, targets 85 megabits. This also applies to Canon's other cameras and even to some of Canon's competition. So lower tier Canon cameras, the R5, or the R6s, the R7s, the R10s, they also target lower bit rates by and large compared to the R5. So the short is, is that, yeah, Canon is definitely has more information in the frame that you ha it has to deal with when it's shooting in HEVC, but it's already compensating for that both by increasing bit rates having a more using the more efficient codec and of course having very high bit rates comparatively speaking so the last thing we want to talk about is changing the video quality the actual process of doing it on the r5 now if you saw my video where i talked about frame rates and resolutions and changing them on the r5 then you already know what's going on here your old hat if not here's the deal we're going to the movie record size menu page this has all of the options for uh, resolution frame rate and compression method. So there's two ways to get there. First is through the menus. So you go to the shoot one menu, you go to the top entry there, which is movie record quality, and then you go to the top entry there, movie record size. Because we're talking about compression methods, you're gonna go to the bottom row, that's where your options are going to be. Now, if you don't like jumping through lots of menus, you can also use the quick control menu to get there. So when the camera is in shooting standby, that is when you have a live image up, but you're not actually recording, you can hit the quick control menu button. That's the cue with a box around it. And then if you look on the left column, the second area or entry down from the top is the set movie record size entry. So it will have on the icon on the menu, it will show you the resolution frame rate and uh, compression method. If you select that on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a large virtual button that says set movie record size. So to get to the movie record size menu, either tap that virtual button on your uh, LCD or push the physical set button on the back of the camera. Now, navigating the movie record size menu is a little bit different from some other menus in Canon's camera. So you can, of course, use the touch controls or the touch screen. You can use the multi-controller or the dials. For the touch screen, just touch the setting you want to select. 
for the multi controller up down left right moves the set active or selected settings around with the dials the thing to remember is the main dial that's the dial that's just behind the shutter release changes the selected value for a given setting so think of it as horizontal scrolling this is what you're going to use to change from raw to raw light to ipb or to all eye to ipb etc the quick command dial, so this is the dial on the back of the camera or the dial around the mode button on the top of the camera, change which setting you're actually making an adjustment to. So think of this as vertical scrolling. Use the quick command dials to switch from resolution to frame rate to compression method. Now, one thing to keep in mind too, the record movie record size menu does require you to push the set button, either the physical one or the virtual one on the screen to save your settings and close out of the menu. Most things on the R5, especially in photo mode, change as soon as you change the setting over and then you could just half press the shutter release and jump back to whatever you were doing. That is not the case with the movie record size menu. You have to push set to save the settings and update the cameras, you know, update the camera settings. You can use the menu button to back out. You can hit the use the half press of the shutter roll button to back out, but you have to use set to keep your settings. Now, of course, with all menus on the R5, if this is something you find yourself using a lot and you don't like the quick control method, you can also add the movie record size menu directly to your my menu on the camera so i'm going to wrap this up here this was compression methods on the r5 for shooting video in a nutshell if you found this useful or at least informative let me know by hitting that like button if this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing please consider subscribing if you're not already and as always thanks for watching and i'll see you next time